Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumim in Israel. There are a few things in life that get us enthusiastic about doing something, like unity. When we are unified in whatever the cause, that cause becomes glorious. Unity can take the most boring, the most unappealing, the most dreaded task and turn it into a dance of teamwork, friendship, and fun. It is almost like a magic pill that lifts the darkness and floods everything with light. It is wonderful in all ways. It is perhaps nothing less than the ultimate goal of humanity. It is likely that the desire for unity goes back to our earliest days as a species. What was a primitive band of early human beings, if not a group held together by the common cause of survival? To be out on one's own or to not have a strong enough clan to stick with and bond with was certain death. We differ from many animals in this this regard, but not all. From the bottom of the food chain to the most intelligent, we see the power of unity. It is ants or bees in a colony working almost like cells in a body to defend the organism of the hive. It is whales or dolphins or chimps forming a society to survive and thrive in the wild. It is elephants mourning the death of one of their own. We took this power with us wherever we journeyed, from Africa to the caves to distant lands across the waters. Unity was always the primary element that facilitated one's group's perseverance against the relentless onslaught of nature and another's failure. In ancient societies, it was unity under a strong leader that determined the power and endurance of any civilization. Individuals may have done the heavy lifting for a while, but it was unity that ultimately decided every people's fate. One only has to look at history to see the vast power of unity. When Rome or Egypt had it, they were empires. When they lost it, they were gone. The same goes throughout the ages. Unity enabled Islam to conquer much of the world, while division was what brought it down. The same could be said for Christianity, for the British Empire, the United States, and countless other national or imperial bodies. It is the force behind any successful political movement and almost any religion. It is what makes a sports team victorious and a musical performance moving. It is the bond that holds any family together. Certainly the Bible is a great promoter of unity. The very idea of monotheism speaks to its power. It is individuals who are the great movers and shakers of the biblical narratives, but they wouldn't have ever become known to the world had the Israelites not formed a united nation that thrived and carried the biblical ideas through the ancient centuries until they became Judaism. The Jewish people itself is, to some degree, the epitome of unity. Sticking together through thick and thin, withstanding the domination of much more powerful enemies for 2,000 years, they are the poster children for what can be accomplished when a group unifies behind a common goal and a unified ideal. There may be other groups out there that could give the Jews a run for their money as far as unity is concerned, but it isn't easy to find them. It makes sense that the prime unifying feature of the ancient Israelites and the Jews is nothing other than God. If there is only one God and everyone is devoted to that God, nothing could possibly be more unifying. The fact is that, by by and large, this has indeed been the case for most of the long history of the Jews. It was also the case in biblical times, except when conflict erupted over the worship of other deities or even differing differing ways of worshiping God. But when there was unity in belief, all was well. One would expect because of this that unity would be considered a great goal of the Bible and something that God would command unequivocally. This week's Parsha is called Noah. That word, word, of course, is the name of the famous Noah of flood fame. He stands as one of the best known figures in human history, ranking up there with Adam, Abraham, Jesus, and Mohammed. There probably are plenty of people who have never heard of the Great Flood from the Bible, but anybody with what can be called a Western background would probably be surprised at finding one. Somehow this story has emerged from the ancient world of the Bible as the universal theme of human destruction and renewal. It may be better known than the Garden of Eden or anything associated with Abraham or Moses. There are only a handful of people who have an entire Parsha named after them, and Noah is the first and probably the easiest to remember. The Flood is the story of God's disappointment with the way the formation of human beings as the final stage of creation turned out. It was a colossal failure due to the human tendency to be, to be drawn to evil. God observed before the Flood that this was their great preoccupation, and there was no hope for redemption other than by starting over. 
This was where Noah entered the picture. He is described at the beginning of the Parsha as a righteous man in his generation, indicating that he was unique in this regard. He was told to build an enormous ark to house representatives of the animal species so that there would be surviving remnants from which to rebuild the world. While the story fr frequently sounds too wild to possibly be true, there have always been historical hints that such an event may have happened in the distant past. Whether it was exactly des as described in the Bible is anybody's guess, but it, it is certainly not out of the question that something like this could have occurred. The aftermath of the flood involved the ark landing on Mount Ararat and Noah emerging to witness a destroyed world. It was his next task to be begin rebuilding it. He brings an offering to God and is told by God that the rainbow was to be a sign that God would never again bring a flood to destroy all life. He then plants, of all things, a vineyard. The Torah then says that he got drunk from the wine and exposed himself in his tent. The different manner in which his three sons treat his indignity results in his blessing or cursing them in their future fates. Then there is a long genealogy listing the nations which came out of each of the three sons' lives. There are a total of 70 of these, which represent the classic 70 nations of the biblical world. After the last of the many names given, the next drama follows. This is the infamous and puzzling story of the Tower of Babel. This story, which appears anticlimactic to the drama of the flood, is simple and short. It takes about 10 verses in all and leaves us with an unclear message. It is introduced with the statement that, quote, the entire earth was one language with unified words. They settled in a region around what is now Iraq and decided to build a tower out of bricks and mortar. The tower was to be made quite high, quote, with its top reaching to heaven. They would thus, quote, make for themselves the name, lest they be scattered over the face of the earth. It is unclear what this fear was and how building the tower would prevent it. At this point, God enters the scene. God comes down to see the tower and the city the people were building. God then says, quote, they are one people and there is one language for them all. And this is what they have begun to do. From now, nothing they plan to do will be unattainable. Therefore, let us go down and confuse their speech so that nobody will understand another's speech. God then scattered them from there over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. Thus, it was called Bab Babel, because there God confused the wor world's language, and from there God scattered them over the face of the earth. That's the entire story. Right after this, the text goes back into more genealogies until the end of the Parsha. This short story has so many questions that it is hard to know where to begin. For starters, what was God's problem with this whole project? Was the desire to remain one unified group with this tower as a unifying goal so terrible that it had to be stopped by divine intervention? It seems that this was indeed the case. But what was so wrong with this idea? The only clue we have is the puzzling line of, quote, from now, nothing they plan to do will be unattainable. But what is so awful about that? Is God so threatened by these invincible and highly determined people that, he, that they have to be driven apart both physically and verbally? On the simple level, the Torah is attempting to explain how people spread all over the world and learn to speak so many different languages, despite coming from one common origin after the flood. This obvious problem needs to be clarified. This tower was the catalyst for all that. But we were still left with the question of why the text states that God felt that the tower was so problematic. There doesn't seem to be any clear answer to this obvious question. But perhaps there is one. As wonderful as unity is, it has dangers. Acknowledging the great benefits of unity doesn't mean that its pitfalls have to be ignored. Perhaps this is precisely what is on display here in the story of the Tower of Baba. The people involved were united in their, in their goal. That much is clear from the text. Whether or not the project of building this tower was wise is left unclear. There doesn't appear to have been anything inherently wrong or evil about it. The problem was that they were unified in this singular task. It was not the building of the tower that was the problem. It was that they would learn from this that they could do anything as long as they stuck together. This was what the text underscores as God's concern with the whole thing. 
It is true that unity is the great driver behind much of human accomplishment. Without it, we probably would never have succeeded as a species. But this success has come at a price. We have learned that we can do whatever we want if we are unified, regardless of the benefits or the risks, the good or the evil. The message of this story is that sometimes we are better off without this tremendous power. We won't use it only for good. In the end, our unity may come back to haunt us and may be a curse rather than a blessing. This is not an easy message to hear, but it seems that this may be the point of the story. We look upon unity as the greatest of our strengths and tend to ignore its many dangers. Nobody is saying that we should not strive for unity in many of our goals and projects. What is being said is that unchecked unity can lead to massive problems. One only need to consider Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia to see the pitfalls. Perhaps the real message here is that unity always has to be tempered with a bit of opposition or else it becomes mere conformity. If everybody is on the same page, there is nobody there to prevent things from going off course. Unity may be a great unifier, but there have to be voices of nonconformity to point out the potential problems. Shabbat Shalom. 